the road to windy. Welcome to the show, Ashley. Welcome, welcome to er- your first Earth Speak, but second time on the show. And your first show is still in the podcast feed, so everyone go check it out. But welcome. I'm going to say welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here with all of y'all in the Earth Speak. It feels really like an aligned time to be connecting. Thank you. Awesome. So before we begin, would you like to lead us on an invocation? I would love that. And so I just want to invite you just to st- settle into wherever you are by just becoming aware of the points of support that your body has. So that means noticing where your body is being held by something else. So a chair, cushion, couch, bed. And as we feel into those points of support, I want to invite us to call in the energies of the elements and the directions and just want to honor that I've been given this way of centering by my abuela, Ana Itz Papalot, of the Metzli Yololitzin Moon Dance in Costa Rica. And I'm so honored to be able to share that with you today. So calling on the energies of the East, the Guardian Quetzalcoatl, and bringing in this beautiful light that we that we call the golden light, this golden dawn, this golden energy. And as we're coming out of summer solstice, really continuing to anchor into ourselves and our cellular bodies, this golden light that comes from the direction of the East, Ometeot. And calling in and bringing and inviting the direction of the West, giving thanks to the guardian, Chipitotec, This is the direction of water. And as we start today, I hear the water raining down. And I think about the waters that have existed on this earth for time upon time. And so I want to bless, honor, and invite the waters into this conversation. Omateo. And calling on and inviting the direction of the north. That's got Lipoca, the guardian, thanking this energy. The North energy, the ancestral energy, giving thanks and inviting your ancestors, the benevolent ones that walk with you, your spirit guides, your ancestral guides, guardians, fairy spirits, tree spirits, the angelic choir, your spiritual team, however you choose to call these folks who have prepared the way for us, wanting to acknowledge them, wanting to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples who are on this land that I have the honor to be on, the Wampanoag, Mohican peoples, and those indigenous stewards, caretakers, and lovers of the land that you are on, Omateo. And calling upon, inviting in the direction of the south, giving thanks to the guardian, Wichli Lapochli, the hummingbird, that helps us to find harmony through conflict. So in whatever challenge you might be facing, whatever challenge that might be surrounding your community or family, inviting the energy of the hummingbird to come in and bless the situation, inviting the energy of the child, blessing and honoring the children in our lives and the children in our heart, mind, body, and soul. And connecting to the direction above, in Palmewani, those near and far, the great blanket of sky that watches over us, the great constellations that guide, direct us, and help us when we have thought we've lost our way. May we remember that we have a place in this wide, expansive universe and trust that and honor that. And inviting in and honoring this beautiful Mother Earth, the sweetness of the earth that we have the honor to rest upon that provides for our every material and soul need. Giving thanks to this abundant, patient, infinitely compassionate teacher that is the earth and thanking this beautiful earth for all that we have the privilege of having access to today. May we walk knowing that we are walking on this beautiful earth body with this body. May we walk in peace and beauty. And the last direction, if you choose to place your hands on your heart, is the yolot. And this heartbeat, this sacred heartbeat that connects us all through a golden thread 
that links all things, reminding us that love is a source, this heartbeat is a source, pumping life through our own bodies and pumping life throughout the celestial, eternal, and infinite existence body. And as we breathe and connect to this YOLO, to this center today, just blessing each and every person that's connected to you through this golden thread of the heart, blessing all of our connections and all of our relations for the highest good, for the greatest good, and the deepest good. Om Thank you. Mm. Mm. Thank you. What a beautiful invocation and blessing. Mm. So would you like to share... Who are your ancestors? I'd love to share. So before, um, well, my name is Sandra Ashni, Kimberly Tiffany Messiah Itzel. I'm the daughter of Cynthia and Alan. I am the daughter of the earth. Um, I'm the mother of my, my dreams and my visions. I'm the granddaughter of Virgie, Ezekiel, John, and Sarah, the great granddaughter of Labode. And my people, my ancestors, come from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And so I like to say that I was conceived in the islands and born in Brooklyn. And I grew up very much with the lived experience of being a, a Caribbean woman. The foods that I ate, the music that I listened to, the, the, the way that I, t- I learned to speak and even relate to my family comes from the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, also known as Euromayin. That is the ancestral name of that land, Euromayin. And so that land is also um, cared for by the Carib nation. And, and, and also on that island, we have the Garifuna people. The Garifuna are a beautiful tribe of people who they wouldn't necessarily say they are matri- matro, ma- matriarch, matriarchal society. They just call themselves a society that just... Um, centers life and source. And um, so we have the Carib nation, the Garifuna nation, and then also the Arawak nation. My great-great-grandmother on my mother's side is Arawak. And so I have these as my ancestors. And then I also count the earth as my oldest ancestor, Um, the earth, the moon, the stars, the trees, uh, the flowers, as my ancestors, the air, the fire, the water. As my ancestors. Thank you. Mm, beautiful. Do you get to go down to the island? And I, yeah, you know, I went when I was a kid a lot, and I hope that I will get to also as an adult go soon. But as a child, I would go for carnival. Um, carnival is a celebration of liberation. We just had Juneteenth here in the States on Saturday. Um, which is a celebration of freedom. And so on the islands, we also have carnival time. And it's a time to also celebrate our freedom and to celebrate the lushness and the beauty of life um, through like harvest as well. Well, cool. Well, I hope you get to go back soon too. Yeah, me too. Me too. And then where in the world are you now? And who are the people of that land? So right now I am in Wampanoag Mohican Territory, which is in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. And I am in Sheffield and stewarding a beautiful space here called Mumbet's Freedom Farm. Um, just thinking about legacy and ancestors. Um, Elizabeth Freeman, also known as Mumbet, was a woman that lived in Sheffield in the 1780s and was an enslaved person living in the house of John Ashley. John Ashley um, was one of the creators or co-creators of something called the Sheffield Declaration. And I like to say that the Sheffield Declaration, I don't know if this is true, but the Sheffield Declaration was actually a precursor to the Declaration of Independence. And so while working in the home of John Ashley, Elizabeth Freeman, um, Mumbet overheard conversations where they were talking about how every man 
has a right to their freedom. And something happened in the home. Stories are like that. Um, Mumbet has a, had a younger sister and the mistress of the house was a little bit temperamental and tried to strike the sister. The stories are different. And so after that happened, Mumbet left the home and ran to the local lawyer's home, who I believe was Sedgwick was the last name. I can't remember the, the first name right now. And decided to advocate for her freedom. And she won. And this was wow. in the 1780s. That's so amazing. Isn't that amazing? And so she kind of paved the way for so many other people, um, so many other enslaved persons that at that time um, were still working, you know, in, in that way and did not realize like so many that they actually were free. And so she advocated for her freedom and she won and continued to be a pillar in her community um, and providing support also for people who were leaving the area during Shay's Rebellion, which was another really amazing, momentous, historical event in this area. And uh, this also, Sheffield is also a great, close to Great Parrington, which is the home of W.E.B. Du Bois, who is the founder of the NAACP. Um, also down the street, we have the Schumacher Center for New Economics, who that was created by, created or founded um, on the work of E.F. Schumacher, who um, basically created all of these new forms of economy and was looking at how to have economies that actually served um, the people and also served hum humanity, not only humanity, but the earth itself. So this area is so rich. And I believe it is also due to the people who have stewarded this land, which are the Mopanag Mohican people. Wow. That's really magical. Was Is the farm you're on just named after her or was it like where she lived? The farm that we're on is named after her. We, na we named the farm cool. after her. And I also want to lift up the Muncie, the Stockbridge Muncie tribe also that um, inhabits this area as well. Wow. What a magical liberation is the word. <laughs> Transformation, liberation. <laughs> cool. I love that. And just thinking of new economies. Wow. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for asking about it. You know, a lot of times people don't really take the time to ask or, you know, recognize, you know, where they're, where we're coming from. So it feels really good um, to just acknowledge that and take a moment to do that. Mm -hmm. There's so much history. I feel like we could probably talk the whole time just about the history of that area. <laughs> probably. There's so much, too. I think that there, I can't remember the name right now, but there was another notable there's so many notable figures. And even, even the, the connection between Mom Bet and W.E.B. Du Bois I was talking about, um, I was talking to someone recently and they were saying, well, Mom Bet was related somehow to W.E.B. Du Bois. I'm not sure the exact relation, but they also have this relationship. And just about, you know, the black people that there was a huge, not a huge, but a big population of black people that actually inhabited and still inhabit this area. And I often think about like, well, oh, okay, well, why this particular area? Um, and I think it just has something to do also with the indigenous folks of their, this area. And I think about what was their relationship to, what was the relationship between the black and the indigenous nations here? And how did they relate to the, you know, the ancestors of the trees here, the elemental beings that, that have lived here? This area has been largely conserved as all sort of like a playground for the white elite you know class for so much time and also within that there have been um not only within that um supporting that has been um the efforts the work and the love of black and indigenous peoples mm, and to, to store it and conserve that land mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow all right. I do want a whole, I'm like, I want a whole, <laughs> I feel like I love just your knowledge of this and passion for it. Oh, thank you. I mean, I just feel like I'm learning so much and they have a great organization here in Sheffield, which I didn't realize that these they, people had these things. So I came here, the Sheffield Historical Society, this guy, Jim, he's been so sweet. And like, I can call anytime and ask them about stuff. He puts his historical evidence like to the side. For us, you know, wow, questions. And so I just, I, I found out that Brooklyn had, a, I used to live in Brooklyn, which Canarsie, 
um, territory. Um, so like, I didn't realize that Brooklyn had a historical society. So like, I encourage you, like, if you are interested in learning more about where you are and who lived there before the historical events, find out if there is a historical society where you live, there probably is. Um, and if there's not a society, there's definitely people who know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Historians and, and even, you know, I imagine some of the original people that land still live there too. And if they haven't been priced out, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, and before you were talking about, like, you were talking about mycelium networks and I think about like information and networks and how mycelium and trees and the earth, how they exchange information, not in the same way that we do through words, but they, they also exchange history. They also hold historical, um, what, well, what we call historical, cultural, social evidence and information within their roots. And I, I believe that's, you know, I believe that these trees that, that have been here for hundreds of years, that they carry that information. They carry those, that knowledge, that wisdom, that understanding, and they transmit that to us through, you know, through their leaves. They transmit that through their sap. They transmit it through their flowers. They transmit it, you know, when they're, when the, when the air is blowing through them and, you know, thinking about the language of this land. Um, and even just moving here recently and feeling so embraced and so welcomed, I feel it's part, part of what, what, what those roots are holding and what these networks of mycelium, maple tree, um, fern, uh, birch tree, what they're holding and what they're transmitting just by they're just standing and, and, and being and rooting here for so long. Uh -huh, totally. Tell us more about, you know, your own adventures in restoring connections with elemental beings. And what, what do you describe elemental beings as? So elemental beings, well, what I describe, so, you know, I think that they are essences, beings that are connected to different elements. So air, fire, water, earth. So we have tree beings, tree spirits, water spirits, fire spirits, star beings. Um, all of these things in nature have a spirit and an essence. And so I feel like since I was a child, I always kind of um, had this connection to things that were beyond words. Like people would say things or, or I would feel things and I wouldn't necessarily find words to describe them. But in the realm of, um, you know, just being outside or like you asked me if I'd ever gone to the islands, going to the island for the first time and feeling the difference in the air, feeling the difference in just the vibration um, in the island and then coming back to Brooklyn, realizing that, OK, yes, it's a different environment. But what actually informs that environment? It's the trees. It's the people. It's the foods that those peoples are eating. Um, and just as, you know, the forest has elemental beings, the city also has its own elemental beings and they're they don't exist in my uh, belief some people believe there are hierarchies to the system but i don't believe that like you know like a city elemental is better or worse than a forest elemental they're just they're just different and they have different purposes and so ways that i've reconnected to or connected to these elements has just been through so many different ways um but i um What's coming to me right now is um, maybe kind of morbid, but I always like to mention my, my younger brother um, who passed away, Keon Frazier, um, through death. And so um, when I was 11 and Keon was eight, he passed away. He was born with kidney failure and was on dialysis most of his life. And we would have so many adventures, you know, and for one of the first things I remember or one of the things because my memory is an interesting thing. But one of the things that I remember as being a child was we we had this spirit that we called Looky Looky in the house. And Looky Looky was like a big Stay puff marshmallow type of spirit. And I just remember like having different instances where we would feel Looky Looky. 
you know, and I would talk to my, my, you know, parents about it and people would be like, oh, that's a jumbi, you know, like ghost kind of, you know, again, they were giving these energies, like words and like sort of also a connotation to me as a child, like that I should be afraid of. Um, when Kian passed away, the night before I had like a, a couple of premonitory dreams where he came to me. Um, he came to me, the whole scene. Your brother or Lucky Lucky came my to you? My brother. My brother came to me. My brother came to me in the dream and how he, the succession of events like that arrived, that, that ended in the ambulance arriving, they showed to me in the dream. Then that night I went to one of my Auntie Lenore's house and I had another dream. And in that dream, um, he came rushing through the back door and there was like a golden light coming through and we were spinning around and we had this amazing ecstatic experience. So I thought that he was still alive. And the next morning I found that he had, he was not alive. Um, and I think that that sort of kind of was like a doorway. I always say that he was like my first teacher, my first master um, in letting me know that there was a world that existed beyond our logical understanding. And I began to start to really, you know, from our looky looky adventures and being scared after ha having those dreams and having different experiences with him, um, both before and then after his death, I started to get really interested in what is this world? What are people not telling me? What are people not telling me? And what is this world that nobody wants to acknowledge or talk about, but I can feel palpably you know when I'm walking down and I start singing a song in the air and the wind starts to blow what is that it's not just like you know some you know some kind of event that you see in a movie and it's like oh it's kind of like oh that there's an exchange happening that I'm not just here going through my day just you know on my own volition yes I can but I'm also a part of a matrix and a web of life that is in constant communication and exchange. And the more I am attuned and awakened to that exchange, the more um, I'm able to communicate. And the ways that we communicate are, are different than, than talking. A lot of times, I mean, it's mainly through just like listening and kind of like this felt sense of like, you just get like a sense, you get like a hit. Sometimes people call it chills or like a gut instinct. Some people call it intuition. Um, some, for some people, you know, these ways of reconnecting with or connecting with elementals comes through the senses. Some people see things like, and sometimes I would see looky looky. Sometimes I might feel it. Um, other people might have um, a, a scent, a smell. Um, so I don't want to say like, okay, this is a way. This is the only way to reconnect because I feel like also through my life, I've connected to spirit and to these elemental beings in different ways. And in some moments, it's really drastic. And in and a lot of moments, it's very subtle. And so I think I would answer your question by saying listening. Listening is how I connect to those elemental beings and listening with a curiosity. Um. I'm reading this book I think I was telling you about at School of Elemental Beings by Karsten Masse, and I might not be saying her name right, but I, um, in the book, Karsten talks about um, being open to, to the elemental beings and how this openness, because the elemental beings, fairies, gnomes, you know, whatever you want to call them, they are, they're here really in deep respect and reverence to humanity, to everything, which is, and humanity is a part of everything. So they're here in deep service and reverence to the earth and humans are a part of that. Um, but they also honor our free will. And so they won't necessarily communicate or connect with us unless we invite that. And so I think part of that listening with openness and curiosity is like, uh, sort of like an invitation listening with a sense of um, curious delight also. It's like, whoa, okay. Like, if you think about, like, looking at, uh, looking at clouds, you know, and how there's this, like, you're... It's a different way of listening. 
um, that I think about when I'm looking at a cloud. It's a, it's a, like a combination like of observation, openness, um, excitement also for what, what shape the cloud is going to take. Um, so I think I will, you know, I could probably, you know, say a lot more or just continue on my little tangent about that. But I think that this, um, this, this, this way of listening that is more expanded, that involves our entire being and is not limited to, um, an idea or a concept we have, but listening in a way that expands us, expands and opens our heart to this realm of, of spirit. Mm, I feel like the elemental beings are like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. And, and so much, you know, I am also in co everyday contact with them and so many of our listeners are, and, and even, I don't know if this is the same for you, but for your own journey, I mean, it sounds like from a very young age, you kind of had connection with the spirit world, just opened up and sealed like boom like this is that happening um and but for a lot of people you know there's has, has this happened for you of like oh my gosh these these elementals these beings these fairies the wind spirits the whatever have been relegated to fairy tales and like oh they're made up they're make believe also they've been you know throughout the centuries have a lot of like evil put onto them and like you said you know, your family would be like, looky, looky, oh, it's just a ghost and putting connotations on it. And like, if I had all these meanings put on it, but um, have you, in this experience, have you had to like reclaim some of that back to like, no, this isn't just made up. This is actually real. Like what I'm sensing, this connection, this relationship, what I'm sensing here is real and it has depth and meaning and its purpose. And it's different from what society says things should look like or what they meaning they put on it like have you had to unpack some of that oh yeah I mean because even in my own family because there is that negative connotation it was like having to reclaim that this spirit and these elements are actually again that they are have such a deep respect they're not trying to hurt anybody you know and actually they can't do that unless there is something you know they can't do that I don't want to say you know because I don't want to Unless there's an invitation, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, but I also want to be careful about that, too, because I don't want to necessarily claim or say that people are inviting certain things because there are ways that people... True, right. Work with, ...work with elements and work with magic that can bypass, you know, natural law. But I will say in my own family, having to, like, reclaim some of that, and I think a lot of it actually, strangely enough, has... To, not strangely enough, I would say... Um, <laughs> it shouldn't be a, a surprise that patriarchy, white capitalist, patriarchal imperialism plays a role in this as well, which is something that, you know, has this like individualism, rugged individualism as a part of it. Or like, we're doing this on our own. There are no spirits or entities or elements that will help us. And not even the recognition of nature as a physical thing. Like that doesn't even get like. <sighs> exactly. Anything that we can't control or commodify becomes a threat. And so elements and elemental beings that they're just free. They're able to travel. They're not bound by time and space become then a threat to capitalism. And so all of these things that are actually helping and providing everything that we have are now seen as something that's separate from us. And even us acknowledging that our own physical beings are comprised of earth, air, fire, water, and spirit um, becomes, um, becomes like woo-woo or becomes like something that's so out there and becomes evil even to acknowledge that spirit lives and moves through us in a certain way. And I, you know, oftentimes when I lead groundings and things like that, I didn't do it today, but I will say, that every single thing that we have is a result of our of the relationship between earth, air, fire, water, and the spirit that moves them. Every single thing, the computer that we that we're we're on right now, our earphones, our jewelry, our clothing, everything that we eat, that we drink, is a result of this spirit and the elemental beings. 
And so capitalism would have us believe that everything that we have is a result of capital and certain types of labor, which is a lie, straight up. Any material that we have that would even be used within a capitalistic venture exists as a result of the relationship between earth, air, fire, water, and the spirit that moves them. Point blank. Whether or not you want to recognize that, whether or not you acknowledge it, like the chair that you're sitting on, everything. We wouldn't have anything if these essences did not exist. And what is it that allows the tree to grow? You know, what is it that makes the rivers flow? Right? And how would it affect us? How would it affect the way that we live and move through life if everyone had that acknowledgement that there is something that moves through things that also moves us, that we're connected to, and that connects all things versus a society, a way of being, a way of moving that says there is only this system that was created by humans that is making everything run and flow, which is capital, which is a lie in my view. Yeah. And so I think that that's part of the reclamation is just acknowledging that everything that exists is a result and of that, that is a result of the relationship between these elements and these elemental beings and realizing that, you know, um, or marveling at that bringing that sense of wonder at that. And also that takes the pressure off of us. <laughs> that we have these help, you know, that we are not alone in this, you know? Yeah. Totally. I would say for that spirit aspect, I, you know, reclaiming that from all the dogma and rules and punishment and everything that religions put on it too, which is part, you know, that the, the control, the system of capitalism that we live in and then the you know religious control all kind of came hand in hand over a handful of centuries for, out of you know rome thanks rome i do love italy though i freaking love italy Me so. too. <laughs> but you know <laughs> but the systems that are, you know we're still living in that domination system that came out of that and that was then later that the opportunistic church took over and said okay fucking control everything you know da, 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 da. so yeah that reclaim ah, i'm gonna get fired up <laughs> y'all this just became one big history lesson i know but then, <laughs> but then you think about also how did rome get to that point too because italy is such a beautiful land and right? they also have such a rich culture like have, there's a woman her name is alessandra baloney and she does um these um dances of like she does like the black madonna and she does tarantella dances and she talks about like the richness of the Italian culture and how they used to have all of these connections to these elemental spirits, the spider being one of them. But what happens when a culture that like that gets forgotten or, or lost? And she's amazing, Alessandra, in really bringing forward and lifting up that tradition that that is before, you know, the the Rome, or maybe, you know, I think that it still exists. So these things also exist in parallel, but they're suppressed. Um, but what happened, what happened in Rome, you know, they're, they're, they also were a society that connected their, their goddesses, their, the, you know, the deities that they honored were also at some point connected to elements. All of these things are, were at some point connected to elements and, and the, and the spirit of nature. And it's not an evil, you know, people want to say, you know, pagan, all whatever they want to say about it. But it's like, what's evil? We freaking live and walk on the earth. Like, what? Well, that's that's that um, that's that Christian propaganda to make it evil so that you don't so that you don't pay attention to the old religion anymore so that you convert. And so and so you can then sell and capitalize off of that, which yeah, it's the ultimate marketing. Exactly. Like, you know, and I think about indigenous tribes when we say, you know, everything is our family, like brother, you know, brother tree, father sky, mother earth, you know, and, and uh, separating people from that way of relating. Because are you going to sell off your brother? Are you going to sell your mother? It becomes much easier to sell your mother or sell your brother when you're not identifying them as such. But if the water is your relation, 
if the water is, the, is your family, then how are you going to commodify your water? If the air is your, is in the stars are your family and your sky, you know, um, if the tree is your relative, you're going to think much more, you're going to think twice before cutting it down. And that slows up production, you know? And so I think about all of these things, like the religion that we're talking about is all about, you know, commodification. And when, if we can restore this connection to these elemental beings through, you know, we talked about listening, but also the acknowledgement that they are our family, that they are our relations, you know, that they, they're our, they're our family. They support us. They love us. They want to see us grow and flower and, and continue to um, enjoy this life on earth, you know, amidst, you know, the challenges of what it means to be a being that has been anchored into this earth realm. They understand that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and when you think, you know, your tree is your brother and you think twice about cutting it down and it slows you down. It also that, that, that commodity to relational paradigm shift is also, uh, inherently fills the gaps the illusions of disconnection that, that that the commodification that the consumerism that the capital uh, the capitalism ideals said oh you have to fill this gap by buying things instead when you have that relation there is no gap anymore because it's connection and so it's like two two levels here mm -hmm. i love that it's all about it that it's connection it's connected that we're connected to something even when we don't know we're connected, we're connected because we're all walking on the earth. And the earth is actually being held together by this beautiful network of mycelium, roots, flowers, all of them. Like when I've been working in the earth at our farm here and I'm actually like, you know, connecting with the soil and preparing to plant. And I'm actually like seeing the roots and seeing like these roots are literally holding the earth together. And that is happening on a global scale, like the, like all across. I think it's just, I can't stop thinking about how fucking amazing that is. Pardon my. That's really cool. Oh, you can, yeah, bring it. How amazing that is that actually like this building is able to stand because there's a network of roots underneath it that are holding it up. Like we wouldn't be able to even have buildings or homes or anything if the roots weren't there. So how are we going to deny that relationship and deny that connection? It's all about this connection and that how wherever we are on the earth, we're all being held by that connection, by that network that we take that that no we can't really see unless we take the time to get down and 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 touch it. Right. Right. Yeah, you're taking me down to a microscopic level now. I'm like, "Ooh, bonds and roots and mycelium and da da da, da. yeah yes <laughs> yeah let's all get in the magic school bus kids <laughs> oops <laughs> yeah mm, yeah so tell us about like what what your relationship with these elements looks like in your day-to-day -day life to like what are what's going on mm -hmm. in my everyday life I mean, it's like I drink my water. Like, <laughs> I drink my water. Legit. Like, I just talk to the water, you know? In the morning, I wake up and the birds are there and I sing and they sing with me, you know? Um, the relationship is like, you know, walking on this earth and just like breathing this air, you know? I don't think there's so, it's just so basic. It's like the basicness and, you know, like that's the slowing down enough to like realize and, and, and acknowledge like, oh, this water. Um, I was going on a hike recently, not recently, within the um, past couple of months and it was during the winter. Um, and we like went up to this waterfall and then we like bushwhacked up, 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 up to the waterfall until we saw the rocks like sweating. And one of the people I was with, I think his name is Zach, Jeremy, and um, Heather had stopped. But we were up there. 
And we were talking about like, wow, like how the, the source of water and how the water was being formed. And I remember like we were talking about like the pressure and like how the rocks would sweat and how that sweat from the rocks, all those little droplets, they, they led to that little pup you know, that little um, pool. And then that pool like fed into the waterfall. And I started to think about like a lot more about the water and the water here is just amazing. Um, and one of the 13 grandmothers, um, she would say that we are water babies, you know, and she talked about the importance of speaking to the water. And some of my other elders and teachers also talked about water as um, water as um, as a divine and intelligent being, which it is. I'm actually co-creating a piece right now. I'm a part of a project called Rites of Passage that's created by a beautiful woman. Her name is Pooja Prema. And she invited me to do a room. Um, the whole Rites of Passage, is it's a big house. It's going to be in Pittsfield. It's happening in August. And it is a room of 65 women of color that are all coming together to fill the rooms of this house. And I'm curating, because we're all curators, not cur like a curator, like a, but like curators. We're like bringing forth the cure. The healing. Yes. So I'm curating a, a room called Woman Heal Thyself, and it's all about water. And it's all about how when we speak to the water, you know, and maybe you're familiar with Masuru Emoto and his work about messages and the hidden messages in water, when we speak to the water, when we connect to the water, we actually change the molecular structure of the water. So simple things, you know, and they do this in the Ifa tradition too. Um, simple things of like speaking into your water, that changes something in the water. And when you take that in, it's like this exchange, that connection, that relationship. You then take that into your body. At some point, it's going to come out. It's going to go down into the earth, and that's going to connect to the other waters. And so, you know, just thinking about ways that I relate on a daily level, it's just drinking my water. It's just the way that I choose to walk upon the earth um, with gratitude. My abuela Ana, who I mentioned earlier, earlier Ana Eats Papalot, you know, she would say, she gave us some really beautiful teachings at the beginning of the pandemic. And one of them was, before you even get out of bed, you know, when you take your first three steps out of bed, you say thank you three times. So it's just kind of like these very simple things. It doesn't need to be like a, it can be. You know, people do whole rituals. People create beautiful altars. We can do all of that. And like, I love that you asked me, what's the day-to-day day -day thing? Because I think sometimes people feel like, oh, they have to do something big. But it's the smallest thing, you know. And I feel like the elemental beings, they express their delight at that. Just our delight at being able to drink water, at the, our delight in being able to wake up another day and walk on the earth, our delight at seeing a seed, you know, sprout through the ground. It's like, as you know, working on the farm and like, you know, planting the seeds in the earth and like being like, oh my God, what's going to happen? And then just seeing the little sprout come up, you know, those are the day-to-day the -day things, you know, and I would say to anybody and everybody listening, you know, like, it's very simple. What are the ways that you feel to connect with, with the elemental beings? Because they're open to whatever way, you know, what ways do you connect? So I might speak to my water. You might speak to your dogs. You might speak to your plants. You might roll around on the grass, like whatever. Just acknowledging the connection um, is so important. I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, thank you. And like for me, I love how it doesn't have to be elaborate. And like for me in the morning, I just say I welcome earth, air, fire, water, and of course the divine and my guides and all. Like I had to do a total simple invocation while I'm walking my dog or on the toilet or whatever. And just like it doesn't have to be fancy or anything. You don't have to put on like certain clothes or do da 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 da, da protocols. Just invitation and and I've heard you say this word a lot, acknowledgement, and that's yeah. so powerful. You know, and I also want to lift up, acknowledge the protocols that do exist because there are yeah, people and there are indigenous stewards and people who carry medicines and their protocols also have provided the space for us to maintain and sustain yes. and cultivate these relationships with our relations. So I want to lift up all of those carriers of those ancient protocols that have, you know, also, you know, 
Many of them have suffered in order to continue to practice their protocol in the way that they have. So I just want to honor and lift them up too. Right. Yeah. And they're not wrong or bad. And it's, it's, it's yeah, all, whatever way you feel called to that you have sacred reciprocal permission to engage with, let's go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, something <laughs> I had to, I have to go here. Um, you said, you know, thinking of like, you know, drinking the water and then we release it. I'm like, yeah, making your pee sacred. Like how cool, you know, like, you know, if you're blessing the water that you're taking in and blessing the water in your body and the, that water is going to come out of you blessed into the sewer. And, exactly. You know? And I mean, I mean, people think about like, you know, our bodily fluids as something, whatever, but you know, the way that seeds travel Seeds travel through the air. Poopy. They also travel through freaking animal poop. So, yeah. you know what? You know, and that's how seeds get from place to place. So they are smart seeds. Very smart. Very smart. Super intelligent. More intelligent. You know, seed intelligence is just, yeah, beyond. Yeah, totally. Totally. Oh, wow. I just got like swept away. And, oh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> seed intelligence. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. And that that reminds me too. Like, I like. Do you do you work with like offerings? And, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I, and I want to say one thing before we get in yours is because that what made me think of it is our bodily fluids. And sometimes, like around where I live, there's ecosystems that if we leave out food or something, it could attract the wrong kind of animals that actually are pre pre um, preying on you know animals that their, maybe their populations are at risk. And so I don't like to always leave food out, which I love leaving food for nature spirits. But I'll bless, you know, I'll spit and I'll just be like, may this, my, I share my water with the earth and these beings and love through this water vibration. So like simple offerings, but I'd love to hear, you know, I'd love to hear about your relationship with offerings. Well, I mean, I love that because I think that also in your spit, it's like, that's like you, the same way that water holds a cellular molecular structure Every bodily fluid that we have, including your spit, your urine, your blood, your shit, you know, all of that holds material that pertains to your particular being and body. And when you are putting that, whatever it is, into the earth, that's like you're speaking. And so I feel like, you know, I'm bleeding right now. And so I'd love to talk about blood offerings. And, yeah. you know, I collect my blood. Um, I think that it's someone said once I heard somewhere that. The reason that all the fighting and war started to happen was because women stopped offering their blood to the earth. Um, because, you know, blood is a sacred life force and, you know, that the energies kind of feed off of that and not in like a malicious way, but because it's life. And so... Like composting almost. Exactly. Exactly. Like, you know, you take a cow shit or chicken manure, you cure it, you feed that into your compost and that actually has certain chemicals and things that feeds the soil. It's not like a morbid, morose or a gross thing. And so the same way of like connecting to our blood as a woman, you know, collecting it and making offerings. In the moon dance, again, my Anna Itzpapalo and one of my dear sisters, Aisha Michal, um, she led a beautiful, my first time doing an offering ceremony. And we opened up a, the, the earth with, with permission and we made a beautiful altar and women of all ages made offerings. So we did offerings of our moon. And then we also, so the older women who were no longer on their moon, they made offerings of their hair. Again, because what? The particles and strands of our hair hold information, hold our cellular structure. And so I think about offerings. You, yes, you can leave food. People leave all sorts of things. But when we leave things that come from our own being, that come from our own body, it's almost like a signature. It's almost like we're saying like, here, this is me doing that. I think about, you know, spirit plates and I would always be like, well, why does spirit get such a little plate? Some people make big ones. I was taught to like make little ones. One bite of each food, right? Like a little bit of each food. I'm like, how come spirit, you know, can only eat a little bit? And then I think again about cell, cell, cellular molecular stuff. If we're thinking about um, food, like as a primary, you know, primarily as a cellular thing and that each structure, the cellular structure of something contains information, 
then spirit only needs a little bit of this information to get the nourishment. If we're thinking about food as nourishment, that's feeding certain things within our bodies and our beings, then spirit only needs that little bit. We've come to a little bit far in that, you know, we have like these extravagant meals, but spirit acknowledges that the information that they need to sustain themselves, to continue going, to inform the way that they move is only a little bit, it might be a particle. And so I think about like um, having this signature of your own being an important thing. I mean, and even if you offer something like food or tobacco, you're still touching it. And so some people blow on it. Some people put their breath. You think about the air particles or the water particles that touch that tobacco from your breath, again, is a signature. And so like, yeah, again, in the same way that there's so many ways to connect, there's so many different ways to offer. Sometimes I make offerings of songs, you know? Sometimes my offering is silence. Um, sometimes my offering is, um, tobacco. Sometimes my offerings are crystals, you know, sometimes my offerings are, um, laughter, smiles, hug, hugging a tree. There's so many different ways to, to make offerings. And again, I think it's unique to each moment and it's not, um, limited by anything, um, limited by any idea in our minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'd love to hear, you know, to a listener, what would you say to a listener who's perhaps like, well, why would you even make an offering to something that can't eat it or can't, you know, like, or you know, like why make, what, why make offerings? <laughs> well, my immediate response was like, why not? <laughs> Because it's a gift. It's like asking the tree, why would you give fruit to that person? The tree's <laughs> just doing it. Why would you even grow? But, you know, again, like, you know, that's my like kind of like. Well, the tree's given fruit because we'll eat the fruit and poop out the seeds. It'll make more tree babies. So. Exactly. But, you know, it, that's true. That is very true. That is very true. But I don't think the tree is thinking about that. Um. It's also sweetness. Yeah, it's like the sweetness. I would just say because why not? Because everything that we're given is a gift. Yes. Everything that we're given is a gift. So again, if you know, going back to white capitalist patriarchal imperialism, it's like versus like everything is here to serve us. Yeah. Yes. In some way, yes, we're in service to each other. But it's also a gift. Why not say thank you? An offering is a thank you. An offering is an acknowledgement. That this didn't have to happen. You didn't have to wake up today. You didn't have to walk onto the earth. The trees didn't have to give you fruit. You know, the vegetables didn't have to grow. All of these things didn't have to happen. An offering is just like a way of acknowledging. Oh, like this exists and this also has life. It has an essence. It has its own purpose and its own life cycle to get pooped out and like give, give birth to some more tree babies. But as a result of it living, breathing, growing, and bringing that fruit, bearing that fruit, I get to enjoy. So why not make an offering, you know? And yeah, as you, as um, just like, you know, maybe you know, prayers, I think about growing up, you know, and like my mom, you know, inviting us to pray before our meals and kind of things like that. It's like, we didn't have to have food. The earth didn't have to give us food in that way. You know, it didn't have to reach our plates, but we can acknowledge that it didn't just come from nowhere. This came from the effort of elementals, humans, and so many other seen and unseen forces altogether. So it's just this acknowledgement also of the, this amazing matrix, this amazing world that we're a part of. And why not take a moment to acknowledge it? Because it doesn't have to be that way. I love that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So much beauty. So tell us about the what you're doing on this farm. Oh, my gosh. So this farm is amazing. So my co-creators, co-collaborators are Steph Wiley, who is a co-owner of um, a cooperative called Brooklyn Packers and Diara Wright. And they are just um, 
we've been having this, we have had this collective and individual vision um, together and apart for like over a decade. And so Mumbet's Freedom Farm is a cooperatively run farm. Um, and so part of what we're doing is just exploring what connection is and what interdependence looks like. And this living, walking, breathing um, realization and understanding that we are not alone and that we are in relationship to the earth and to each other and learning how to be in a good relationship, you know, um, and restoring connection to land, to home, to ourselves. And so our, the Mumbets Freedom Farm is a farm and sanctuary where people can cultivate and find home. And we do that um, through farming, through different programs, and also because we're establishing a sense of, of home on the farm with our physical homes, but also giving folks the space to explore what home can look like when we find home within ourselves and doing that through connecting to, to the earth um, and through cultivating and restoring relationships to these elements of earth, fire, air, water, and spirit that connects them. I love that. Mm. Yeah, and so we're growing stuff. We are growing, um, well, Kalalu. Kalalu, I'll talk about Kalalu because that's my ancestral food. Kalalu is a green. If you haven't had it, I highly recommend it. What family is it in? Kalalu is in, I think it's in, actually it's a green. I think it's amaranth people know it as. Um, but you can eat the leaves and it's like yeah. spinach-like. I would say even more tender. It's super tender. And growing up, I would eat kalalu soup. Kalalu soup is a green soup that they put fish in. And it was one of my favorite soups. Um, and it's just a beautiful, it's very prolific. Um, people think of it as a weed, you know, so some people chop it down, but it is a vital food. And when I connect to the spirit of amaranth, I connect to a joyful, resilient, and strong spirit that is able to feed us the fuel that we need to continue to um, move and live and thrive within environments that can be very challenging. So we're growing kalalu, we're growing collards, um, we're growing kale, we got radishes we're harvesting now, cucumber, herbs, garlic, tons of flowers because I'm a flower essence therapist, um, and just so much more. So, and just um, doing so much, I can, yeah, it's, it's uh, so many different things. So if you want to find out more, we have a website, mumbetsfreedomfarm.com, so you can check, check that out. Of course, that'll be in the show notes too, everybody. You can click it there. Oh, awesome. And in like, I'd love to hear about your kind of day-to-day -day life there. Like what do, what do you like, do, how do you, how do you actually go about doing this? Oh my gosh. I don't know. You know? Like, oh, how am I doing does, this? Like, does anyone know what they're doing? I, I don't think so. I think we're all learning. I mean, I think that's a part of it is that, you know, I'm an Aries, so I'm very much like duh, 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 in some ways, but I have an Aquarius moon, which, you know, softens me a little bit. Um, so for me, the most important things are like waking up with that sense of gratitude in the morning. I sing in the morning. Um, I'm in a tent right now, so I don't have my water altar, but I connect with the water um, daily. And then, you know, going straight to the farm, seeing what needs to be weeded, watered, I'm trying to do that before like 10, because at 10, I start to, you know, see clients um, do stuff for Minka. Minka Brooklyn is another organization, amazing collective that I work for that works at the intersections of healing and social justice. And so um, I try to get all the things in the morning done in the morning time, also before the sun gets too hot, um, and then doing like my work for clients and things like that. Um, and then going back to the farm, um, building, you know, thinking about building the house. We built a kitchen down there. So it's like, you know, building the kitchen, getting the yurt together, um, we also share meals here. Um, so cooking, eating together is a big part of the day. Um, we were in a pod here at this beautiful space that I'm at called Race Brook Lodge. Um, and I was in a pod with amazing people and I love them dearly. And we've kind of like shifted because the lodge is reopening, but we were also having like movie night and uh, sauna or oh, was it spa night karaoke where we would like put face masks on and soak our feet and 
sing karaoke. And that's like the, the heart child of a beautiful sister, Jeannie Sai, an amazing filmmaker um, and photographer. Um, so like, you know, having art nights and things like that. And so the days, every day looks different. And every day involves like learning, you know, that um, I don't know everything and I can't do it alone. And actually, that is the greatest blessing that I could ever ask for. I don't need to know everything. And I won't, wouldn't ever want to do any of this alone. Yeah, that's, I feel like that's such a beautiful way to put it. <laughs> can't mm. do it alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I'm, we haven't even talked at all about tapping. Do you want to? <laughs> I mean, it's well, cool. well, it's a whole other situation. It's a whole other. So, I mean, I would say, you know, we're talking about connections, right? And we're talking about mycelium. Yep. We're talking about yep. networks. And so um, tapping, also known as EFT, stands for emotional freedom technique. Um, and I think about like emotions as energy in motion. And it's it, it energy, you know, these are things that also are connectors, things that connect um our ideas about something to our actions. So the way we feel about something informs how we act, how we think about things. And so EFT really informs us and gives us a resource so that we can ride the waves, so that we can understand the connections and not get so identified. You know, it's not like I am angry, but I feel angry. Or not I am sad, I'm feeling sadness. And being able to ride the waves of what we're, is that we're, we're, um, we're, we're moving through. Um, so that's the, what I'll be teaching in a few months with you all tapping in, you know, um, somatics and EFT for resilience. And there might be another t uh, title for it, but that's usually what I call it. And, you know, both somatics and EFT, um, somatic experiencing in particular, because that's what I'm trained in really provides us um, with toys, as Resma Menicum would say, to um, regulate our nervous systems. And so tapping is, is one way we can regulate through actually tapping on different parts of our body, you know, connecting to the networks of energy um, within our body and also using certain words and phrases to understand what it is that we're saying to ourselves and how it is that we're relating to our emotional states. Um, and the somatics piece is really about um, getting to know ourselves and our responses and normalizing our responses versus demonizing ourselves for feeling and acting out in a certain way and understanding that the ways that we um, have learned to act are learned and part of it is as a result of conditioning. And in order to start to undo some of that stuff, we first need to bring this awareness to it. Um, and not an awareness that is critical, but awareness that has that compassion and understanding for ourselves um, and what we, the world that we have been born into, which is a world that, you know, in some ways has really, um, rather than invite us to have these connections, um, has invited more of a separatism and the individualism versus understanding how all of our systems work together, how our mind, body, heart work together, and they can work together. So EFT and somatic experiencing really sort of help to restore this equal, re equilibrium and regulation um, and understanding um, to how our mind, heart, body, and spirit can work together effic efficiently, effectively. Um, joyfully um authentically really mm, so it sounds like the way you approach eft and somatics is really around uh i like you said toys i guess it's like tools toys uh play there and how they can help us um heal and be liberated from the illusions of separation that we've been kind of handed down through the whole, you know, all the history we've just talked about in this episode through all these systems and control and everything. So yeah, really powerful. Yeah. I mean, and that comes really Resma Menachem, who wrote My Grandmother's Hands, which is an amazing book about um, racialized trauma, um, 
says toys because tools are used to fix something. Ooh, I love that. And as that we're not broken. And toys are something that we can use to explore, that we can play with. And so if you want to learn more about that context, I invite you to dive deeper into his work. He's very, he's brilliant. Awesome. And play is the way, I mean, okay, this was full circle because my relationship with the elemental beings is all about, they're like play, like play, like play is in itself such a healing energy to be in. It, it, it's just, yeah. And, you know, we've been so conditioned to like work, effort, fix, tools. And it's it's a whole mindset. And those words themselves keep us in that mindset such that we can't even see that we're perpetuating more of the system in these things that we think we're doing to heal. And it's kind of bizarre when you're like, wait, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, so I love that, you know, these words are powerful. Mm hmm. Words are very powerful. And that phrase comes up. I can't remember. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And it's like, well, what about toys? What if we had toys in the master's house, you know? Um, and what would that do if we, you know, just filled it with, like, all these new toys, you know? Because, like, those tools, it's like, again, it's like understanding that. Yeah, I really just think it's so important to to understand that or to say or that the connections have never been broken between us and the elemental world. We just have to use play and this, you know, this sort of curiosity and openness and, and awe and wonder, you know? And, you know, talking about how words are important and how words are so vital, it's like you think about a word like awful and how that word was like derived and, and modified because actually if you break it down, the words awe and full, it's full of awe. But now how it has come to be something that's a negative, you know, how being full of awe for nature, for life, reverence for this existence has become something that's kind of looked down upon, you know. And I think that we need to restore that playfulness, restore that sense of like, we're all learning here, you know. Um, and I know that that's something that I work on, too. I'm not perfect at it, too. And, you know, learning just to be playful it's something that i i strive towards every day to be in in, in awe i love that i mean i'm not perf i'm unlearning a lot every day <laughs> to <I> feel that <laughs> oh man i want to talk about flowers with you but i'm feeling maybe a secret episode on that you game yeah Okay, well, let's wrap this up. And what, you know, what do you offer? You say you work with clients. What do you offer and where can people find you? People can find me on my website, cinderashni.com or mumbetsfreedomfarm.com. You could probably find me on the farm. Um, <laughs> just come on down to the farm. Seriously, we have work days every day. And we actually are looking for like, if you want to come and camp and support and learn how to connect with the earth and learn about connecting to the elemental beings, please come and visit us. Um, I, I work with clients doing somatic experiencing and, and flower essence therapy. And that sometimes I do incorporate to row and EFT and light language, which, you know, are a whole bunch of other things that I could talk to you more about. Um, right now I am limiting my, my client base just because I have so much work on the farm and, you know, I invite people who want to work with me to have a commitment of three months or more. And yeah, I'll be doing some retreats also. So starting in September, you know, I'll be doing some retreats in person um, as I sort of move more towards doing group work. Um, just because, you know, having a farm and, and seeing clients is a lot. So I invite you to just come here. You know, we can go for a walk together, you know, and work together in that way um, and plant some seeds or harvest some flowers. And we can work together in that way. And if you want to work with me therapeutically, you can reach out. Amazing. Beautiful. And I'll, I'll just say here, you know, with my therapist, I found my therapist because I was looking for someone doing somatic experiencing and I love it. And I think if someone's looking for that, uh, you know, somatic therapy, that's now you know where to go. Here I am woman of color doing somatic experiencing right here, right here. And plus you're versed in intuition and magic and spirit, which is so powerful. That's, yeah, 
Really cool. Awesome. Well, all of that's linked in the show notes, of course. And so, so people can get go over to your email list and hang out with you and go to your website, sign up, hire you, do some good work and um, and yeah, connect with the farm and stuff. Very cool. Well, we're going to be doing you're going to come and do a workshop uh, with us pretty soon and for the collective and workshops are collective only now. So if you all want to get in on it, you know where to go. And um, yeah, and we're going to be doing exploring those EFT and somatics and of course, magics runs through everything you do and we'll, we'll y'all yeah, be hearing more about it soon so um very cool thanks for coming and hanging out with us today and we thank can't wait you. To see you this was an yeah. amazing fun juicy conversation so thank you so much it's been such a good good time thank you and thanks to all the spirits you've called in and to the elemental beings for yeah coming playing with yeah, us today I, mean, I also want to just you know give thanks to our hearts and mm. you know to the earth to the sky to the south the child in us to our ancestors to the spirit of the west and the east and just thank them for being a part of this conversation and for for just being such a blessing in our lives and reminding us of where we are who we are and of the good relationships we can have give thanks so much so much gratitude thank you all the roads are winding Listen to over 200 free EarthSpeak podcast episodes on your favorite podcast app and visit earthspeak.love to learn about our collective community and workshops.